Good evening, everyone. Welcome, my name is Greg Gorga. I'm the executive director here at the Maritime Museum. Wow, all right. Folks are at the bar already, I see. Nice. You are here for Into the Shark Zone by uh, Harry Raven, Raven, Harry Raven, Tom Piazze, and Dr. Chris Lowe. Uh, I'm gonna introduce them all right now. Harry and I think uh, uh, Tom, if he's here, are gonna introduce the film. And then afterwards, uh, Chris is gonna come up uh, and tell you a little bit more. And then we'll do a Q&A that I'll moderate, all right? So Harry Raven uh, um, attended UCSB and has worked on dozens of documentaries for National Geographic, Discovery, and Weather Channel, in addition to indie feature films at news outlets, including NBC's Dateline, to The Today Show, and Nightly News. His passion for the ocean and all marine life recently prompted the formation of Reef Guardians, a nonprofit where he plays a lead role in working with scientists and researchers to better understand and solve the problems plaguing our reef systems in both Hawaii and here in California. And he has served as a media producer and advisor for the prestigious Academy of Underwater Arts and Sciences for the last five years. Uh, and his production company is right here in Santa Barbara, On Wave Productions. Tom Piozze has owned and operated Home Planet Productions for more than 20 years. Um, he has credits uh, with NBC, ABC, CBS, Discovery Networks, National Geographic, PBS, BBC, uh, and a bunch of others. He has received an Emmy nomination for the, uh, the Nepal earthquake coverage on NBC and has a widely acclaimed 2002 feature film, Tibet, Cry of the Snow Lion, won awards on six different continents. And in the morning hours of January 9th, 2018, Tom captured footage of the dramatic rescue of a teenage girl trapped in the remains of a house crushed during the Montecito debris flow, which I'm sure all of you saw because it went viral all around the world. Dr. Chris Lowe is a professor in marine biology and director of the Shark Lab in, at California State University, Long Beach, and he works with acoustic and satellite telemetry to study the movement, behavior, and site physiology of sharks, rays, and game fish. He holds a degrees in marine biology and zoology. For the last 10 years, Dr. Chris has, and his students have been studying the juvenile white sharks of Southern California and have greatly contributed to the field of knowledge uh, for this enig enigmatic species. In addition, they have worked on the development of underwater robots to autonomous, autonomously track sharks and game fish. So please join me in welcoming Harry and, uh, and Tom. Oh my. Well, we, I think we have a pretty exciting evening for you, but I, I have to say I'm just deeply honored to have been in this community for 40 years. And yeah, it's really great to see a lot of friends here, associates, new friends. And Tom and I put this film together as well as a couple other films around here, so it's really great to be able to show films that took place in our own community. So uh, I can go on talking forever, I'm gonna make it brief, but. Basically, we're gonna show you the film that's called Into the Shark Zone. After that, uh, Dr. Lowe's gonna come up here and kind of tell you where we're at, where the film leaves off, and then we're gonna show you a little preview of what's coming from our next film called Great White Junior High. Red alert, okay. <laughs> so with that, I'm gonna hit the button here, and do uh, you have anything you wanna say there, Tom? Um, no, just thank, thanks for having us at the Maritime Museum, and I've been, uh, trying to get Harry to hold back some of this footage so these films are finally finished because this, uh, the, the longer version of the shark film, the next one, is what, the one we really want to publicize. Yep. So, but thanks for coming. Okay, here we go. Master of the oceans has taken over these peaceful waters. This gorgeous coastline is now home to great white sharks. There's a white shark right there. Unbelievable. The locals have to deal with their new neighbors. When I turned around and I saw his head out of the water thrashing my fin, I immediately knew it was a great white. I, I don't think I'd want to be swimming around out here with these size sharks around. It's, we've had to create some new procedures. Uh, to try and keep everybody safe. There's a shark stand right over there. The question is, why? Some of this activity that we're seeing here very well could be related to global climate change. Researchers head out on the water. They want to tag these great whites to find out why they're here and how long they may stay. 
I can't believe how close they're coming. Back no, the other wait, way. Wait, there he goes. There he goes. Got it. We're going just a few feet offshore and into the shark zone. Okay, we're going to bring up Dr. Chris Lowe, and he's going to kind of continue where this film left off. Where did these sharks go? And Chris is going to give us, I guess, the latest data on that and kind of explain more about what we've learned from these incredible creatures. And by the way, a lot of people here helped us with this film. Monty Rook, who used his footage from uh, Guadalupe Island, and Steve, our sound man, is here. So it's great that we have all these lovely resources right here in our own town. So without further ado, here is Chris Lowe. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first time to the museum, and it's awesome. So, so thank you for the invite. Um, so the work I'm going to talk a little bit about today is work that we've literally been working on for a decade now. So, and it's really interesting because I was a graduate student in California back in the late 80s, and of course, all the time I would go out looking for sharks, I, I never heard of people seeing white sharks along the coast. It was very rare. So as a shark biologist, to, to, to think that sharks have come back in that way is kind of remarkable. It's very exciting. I have to pinch myself every day saying, how, how did this happen? But the bottom line is white sharks are kind of enigmatic. They are the Discovery Channel darlings. They're the, they're the species that everybody thinks of when you say the word shark. And of course, they've had a very rough history globally, not just here in California, but many places around the world. They were either overfished, overhunted, or their food was eliminated, and therefore their populations have been impacted for quite a long time. But the bottom line is in California, if you ask anybody, you know, what kind of shark a, a white shark was, they, they would give you a different answer 20 years ago than they would today. So for example, one of the things that we've known historically is that it's not uncommon to see adult white sharks around places like the Farallon Islands and Anya Nuevo Island. And then of course down off Guadalupe, particularly in the fall months, between about November and about February. And of course the reason why those sharks would come in close to shore or come into these areas is to take advantage of these nice, fat, plump, delicious meals. So it was the northern elephant seals that would come in and use the beaches as their rookery and give birth to their young there. That was the draw for white sharks. It brought, them these, brought these sharks to these locations because those were good, easy targets and very good meals for them. In addition, we've learned a lot about white shark distribution in California, but primarily from fishing. So California's had a very rich history of, of fishing, both recreational and commercial fishing. And in those records, we know that white sharks have occurred along the coast and, and have occurred in various locations, but we didn't know a lot about where they give birth or where they spend most of their time or how much time they spend in many of these locations. So my students and I combed through old fishing records dating back to 1936, and one of the things that we found which was very interesting is that a majority of the white sharks reported caught in any fishery were caught in the gillnet fisheries. So gillnet fishing really became prominent back in the 40s, but the net that they used was made out of cotton, and it was visible. And it wasn't until the 70s, until the advent of plastic, that they started using monofilament. And that net became very, very cheap, and it became a very effective method of fishing. So one of the things that we noticed was about 88% of all the white sharks reported in any fishery, any commercial or recreational fishery, were caught in the entanglement fishery. And a vast majority of the records indicated that most of those sharks that were caught in that fishery were babies. Now a white shark is born between about four and a half and five and a half feet long. Females give birth to anywhere between two and 10 babies in a litter. And then females may give birth may about every three years. In addition, White sharks, we know, have life histories kind of like people. They take about nine to 12 years to reach sexual maturity. Um, females may live to be 45 to 70 years old. Same with males. Females get a little bit larger than males. In addition, uh, females only give birth to a litter about every three years. So as a result, they're very easy to overfish. But despite the fact that there's never been a directed fishery for white sharks anywhere, because there's never been enough of them to support a directed fishery, they've always been a value. Their meat has always been a value. In fact, if you ate fish tacos here in Santa Barbara back in the late 80s, the early 90s, chances are you ate white shark and you didn't know it. Because it looks and tastes exactly like mako shark or thresher shark. 
In addition, a set of adult white shark jaws can sell for over $16,000, and the fins can sell for over $200 a pound dried. But there's never been a directed fishery for them. So they've been incidentally caught in commercial fisheries, and when they were caught, they were always sold and landed. So in California, many of the incidentally caught white sharks were landed in fish markets, and that's where they showed up in fish tacos. But what's amazing is that back in 1994, despite the occasional bite on people, California had the wherewithal to protect white sharks because we recognized their vulnerability to being overfished and their importance in marine ecosystems. And in, 2000, in 1997, they were protected throughout the US Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. And then in 2004, they were protected under CITES. So CITES is an international organization that regulates trade of wildlife. So it was illegal to sell white shark jaws, teeth, skin, or meat internationally after 2004. And then in 2005, white sharks were protected throughout the rest of US waters. So pretty much every place where white sharks occur in numbers, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, and the US, white sharks have been protected from anywhere from 10 to 25 years. So when we go back to that gillnet fishery, there's some really interesting patterns that we see. So the, these are the number of gillnets set, and there are two types of gillnet fisheries. There's an inshore and an offshore fishery that's targeting different species. And we see that both of these fisheries kind of peak in the mid-1980s because the fisheries really exploded. And then what happens, we see that the number of nets being set start to go down, but you can see the number of sharks reported caught in the fishery peak during the peak and then steadily decline. Now part of that is because they're regulating the fishery, and the fisheries are actually overfishing the target species that they were out harvesting, and there were fewer fish to catch. But what happened in 1994 were two things. White sharks were protected, so if a fisherman caught a white shark prior to this, they would land them, but after 1994, they had to release them at sea. The other thing that happened in 1994 is the state of California voters voted to ban the use of gillnets in state waters. That meant from the shoreline out to three miles. So at that point, there's still gillnet fishing occurring outside three miles off the coast of California, but it's been reduced by 82% since its peak. But what was really interesting is this significant increase in the number of sharks reported caught in the remaining fishery after 2005. So what this indicates to us is that this really could be a sign of an increase in the population, which makes sense. If you stop killing them back in 1994, individuals that normally would have been died or became a fish taco are now sexually mature by the time 2005 shows up, which means they're now producing their own young. So the pattern that we're seeing is indicative of population recovery, and that's possibly just through protection. In addition, the other thing that we learned was 20 years ago, if you asked any biologist what kind of shark we thought a white shark was, we had said a coastal shark. And if you asked how we knew that, we'd say, well, in the fall, you know, between November and February, we see them along the beaches and in Nuevo and places like that. But our colleagues started to tag white sharks with satellite tags at these locations during those fall months. And what we literally found overnight was that all of those sharks leave these aggregation sites when the elephant seals leave, and they migrate out to this area in the middle of the Pacific, halfway between Baja and Hawaii. And those sharks will spend eight months and a year and a half out there before returning back to one of these aggregation sites. So literally what happened overnight was our view of white sharks being a coastal shark to actually being an oceanic shark changed. And that was solely due to the advances that this new technology gave us in terms of what these sharks do. The other thing that we learned, or the other reason why white sharks come back, isn't just to feed on those elephant seals. We also know that in the spring, usually starting in April till about October, it is not uncommon for recreational fishers to catch baby white sharks off our coastal beaches and piers. So based on this, we hypothesize that our Southern California bite, our beaches, are the nursery for white sharks in the Northeast Pacific. Now we don't know where they actually give birth, we just know that these babies start showing up starting in the spring or summer, and then once they find a beach, they'll hang out at a beach for quite some time. So starting in 2006, we began a collaboration with Monterey Bay Aquarium to try to answer questions about where these young sharks are going. So to do this, we began collaborating with many of the gillnet fishers, and Chuck Winkler, who's actually here, is a partner with us on this project, and he helped us identify fishers who would catch these sharks. They would call us up and say, we caught a shark, we're gonna be at the dock at this time, come meet us, and we could take measurements, tag that shark, take that shark out and release it, and we could answer some questions, like, if a shark's caught in a gill net, can it survive that? 
If you take it back out and you tag it and release it, can it survive that? Um, if they do survive, where do they go? So here's a baby white shark, a commercial fisherman. This is a fish tote. Um, the other question is how often do they interact with the gillnet fishery, the fishery that does interact with them periodically? And then, of course, how far do they migrate? So if we tag them in Southern California and they're babies, do they stay here year-round? Do they migrate somewhere? Where do they go? And then, of course, what we want to know is do they show fidelity? So if they do migrate somewhere, do they come back to the beach that they hung out as, as when they were babies, their nursery beach? So to answer these questions, my students and I and Chuck would meet the fishermen down at the dock. We could take measurements of the shark. We could take blood samples, tissue samples, so we could do genetic analysis. And then we could fit the sharks with a variety of different transmitters to ask questions, answer some of these types of questions, and figure out where they're going and where they're spending their time. So to do this, we use a variety of technology. And some of them were mentioned in the film. So one type we use are called spot tags. These are tags that get bolted to the shark's dorsal fin, and it's essentially a radio transmitter. So every time the fin breaks the surface, this transmits to satellites in space. Those satellites in space then send me an email to my office saying shark number 205 popped up at this latitude and longitude. Now the minute the shark goes into water, the transmitter turns off because radio waves do not penetrate through seawater. So the problem with this technique was white sharks, are they're not marine mammals. They don't have to come to the surface to breathe. So we had no idea how much information we would get using this technique. So we used another technique called pop-off archiving satellite tags. Now these all also get darted in the shark's back. These have a little transmitter, a little, little um, transmitter attached to a computer. It's got a depth sensor, a temperature sensor, and a light sensor. And it's recording that information every 30 seconds or five minutes, anytime we want. And then at a pre-described time and date, that pops off the shark, floats to the surface, uploads all the data to the satellite, and then that downloads it all to my office. So then we can recreate that track of where that shark went. Now the problem using this method, like ancient mariners would use you know, day length as a way of estimating latitude and longitude. So unfortunately, this method isn't nearly as accurate as that. So sometimes the shark could either be off Long Beach or it would give us a position of it being in Compton. So, so <laughs> it wasn't very accurate in terms of its geographical position, but it gave us really accurate information about the depth and the temperature of water that those sharks like to move through. But if we really want to get accurate information about where that shark was spending its time, we would surgically plant or dart an acoustic tag into the shark's back, like you saw in the film. Now, if we can catch the shark, we can flip the shark over. And when you do that to a shark, they go into something called tonic immobility. They go to sleep. We can make a surgical incision into the shark's body cavity, insert one of these transmitters, which has a 10-year battery life. That enables us to track a shark from its infancy almost to adulthood. We'd suture that shark up, turn it over, and off it would swim. Now, when one of those sharks swims within about 300 yards of one of our underwater acoustic receivers, the receiver logs the time, the date, and the ID number. And then we could go out and pick up all that information. So our receivers are located all along the coastline, all around the offshore islands, and many of them are less than 100 yards off the beaches. So we could use this to determine how much time sharks are spending swimming along our beaches. So initially, we would get our sharks from commercial fishers that would catch them, but we found that that took a lot of time, and of course, we knew based on pilot uh, observations that the sharks were just offshore. So one technique we would use is we'd hire a purse saner and a spotter plane to go out and spot the sharks for us. Here's a shark in the net. We'd set the purse saner around the net. We could purse the net up, take the shark out, and we could work it up just like we would if we got it from a commercial fisher. So this was a great technique. The problem was it cost us about $5,000 per shark to do. The other problem was the sharks were actually closer to the shoreline than our permit would allow us to fish. So our permit would not allow us to use this method within 900 feet of a beach. So we got new partners. <laughs> so our new partners were the lifeguards all along the Southern California coast. And quite often they would say, we know where the sharks are. The sharks are right here. They're just outside the wave break. So by working with the lifeguards, we would use spotter planes or we would use drones. We'd put my, I'd put my grad students on the back of one of the lifeguard jet ski tow boards and then they would tell the lifeguard jet ski operators where the shark was and then they could drive up alongside the shark. And here's a little video of one of my students shot. So you can see how close we are to the shore. You can drop in the water and we can dart a transmitter into the shark's back. So quite often, right now, he's standing up. That's how shallow he is. 
So quite often using this technique, we could tag five or six sharks in a three or four hour period using this method. And of course, we always did this working with lifeguards and along the lifeguard beaches so that we could make sure that what we were doing was safe for us, safe for the public, and safe for the sharks. So some of the things that we've learned so far from some of this technology is kind of amazing. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is one of those pop-off satellite tags. And what you're gonna see is a gray smudge up here. And that somewhere in the middle of that gray cloud is the actual position of the shark. So what you're gonna see is a date counter up here, and then you're gonna see sea surface temperature. So the redder, the warmer the water, the bluer the cold. So here we are at the date up here. So here you can see this is, um, this is August. We can see the water is still nice and warm up in Southern California. There's our black smudge. And then we get to October and our water temperatures start cooling down and it actually starts driving the shark south. The shark comes all the way down to this area called Vizcayano Bay. And then around January, the tag pops off the shark. Now, prior to 2015, pretty much every single shark we tagged showed this migratory behavior in the winter. So when our water temperatures dip below about 60 degrees, every shark did that. Now we also, the same year, had another shark that we managed to tag, but this shark was actually brought up to Monterey Bay Aquarium and kept on exhibit in Monterey Bay Aquarium for five months. Now that shark gained 100 pounds in five months. <laughs> and the aquarium was getting a little worried about trying to get it out of the tank and it was eyeing its tank mates, its very expensive <laughs> tank mates. So they decided that they should take it out and they released it in Monterey in February. Anybody want to take a guess on how cold the water is in February in Monterey? It's pretty cold. Okay, so here's our black smudge up here. Watch what happens. They don't like cold water. <laughs> so they come all, it had to come to Mazatlan to warm up. So what's really cool is that here you'll see in April, see the slug of warm water? This happens every year. The slug of warm water starts driving the shark up into the Gulf pushes it almost all the way up to Bay of LA, and right before the tag popped off, that shark started hanging out about 150 feet, where the water temperature is about 70 degrees, where the surface temperature here is about 82 to 84 degrees. So what this technology tells us is that these baby white sharks are kind of like the three bears. They don't like it too warm, and they don't like it too cold. But using that information, we can begin to predict where we should expect to find these sharks based on this temperature preference that they show. The other thing that we've learned quite often during the summer, especially with the really small ones, the babies, the ones that we call young of the year, they're less than a year old, is that typically if you see one in an area, you're gonna see more than one. So here's an aerial photograph. Roll Rogers Beach is just off screen. Here's two stand-up paddleboarders. And basically, it's not uncommon for us in an area maybe the size of about two or three football fields to see up to a dozen or up to 15 juvenile white sharks all hanging out together. And what you can see is, as you're pointing out in the film, they're not right next to each other, but they're kind of in the same area. So the question is, are they doing that because they want to be near each other? The other question is, are they all from the same litter? Are they brothers and sisters? And these are techno there, there's technology we can use to answer those questions but we're, we're just on the cusp of starting to do that. So here's our current acoustic receiver array that we have in Southern California. We're gonna be putting out another 40 receivers. So a bulk of our receivers are right along these beaches in these areas. We have an array around Catalina. We have an array around the Channel Islands and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary is a partner with us in, us in this research. So what you see here is what we call an abacus plot. So every line that you see here is a shark. And then the color corresponds to the location. So the redder, that means a shark that went down to Mexico. And then the bluer might be sharks that went all the way up to Monterey. And here we have the dates. So the gray areas that you see are basically summertime. So what you're going to notice is that we've had some sharks that we've been able to track for seven years. Those are the ones that we internally implanted transmitters into. And some of those sharks have made repeated annual migrations between Southern California and Mexico and back. By the time they're two years old, we start to see them using the Channel Islands, and we also had sharks going to Guadalupe Island. So by the time they're two years old, they're getting to be around seven feet long, we estimate. So, so far, we're really starting to get some good information about not just what the babies do, but about what those tweeners do that we talked about in the film. Now, this past year, we managed to tag about 11 sharks at Padero, right off Padero, and what you're gonna see here are, believe it or not, there's lots of hash marks. Those hash marks indicate detections that we got under receivers. 
And what you're gonna notice is that we had some sharks that actually went south. We had one of the sharks, as pointed out in the film, go all the way down to Viscano Bay. We had another shark that we tagged at Padero that actually went all the way up to Monterey and the pop-off satellite tag just popped off there about a month ago. So we know that those sharks that we've tagged at Padero have been moving around quite a bit. Now what's really interesting was we detected all these sharks until about June 25th and about the same day all the sharks left but one and what's really interesting is at that same time we noticed that a pretty significant red tide moved in close to the beach. So as we begin to amass some of this environmental data, we might begin to better predict why some of these sharks show some of the patterns that they do and what might induce them to leave a beach and go somewhere else. So if we look at the number of sharks tagged per region, so this is the mean number, mean number of sharks per region scaled to the total number of detections that we got just in 2018. That's just been since January. You can see that that area off Padero and Santa Barbara has been the hot spot in 2018. Whereas places like Long Beach and Dana Point were the hot spots in 2017. So every year we see sharks kind of hanging out at different places. So the bigger the bubble, the greater the percentage of detections. We can also look at the number of sharks detected since 2018. So we can see that we've had sharks detected all the way up to Monterey. So some of the sharks that we've tagged down here have moved all the way up there. But we see that this area of Santa Barbara and Ventura, Santa Monica Bay, Huntington Beach, Long Beach, and Dana Point, San Onofre appear to be hotspot areas. These are areas that we refer to nursery hotspots. And any given summer, sharks can show up at one of those hotspot beaches, and during the summer, they can move from one hotspot beach to the next. And we do not know why they select a particular beach and what causes them to hopscotch to the next beach. So to answer some of these questions, we're developing new technology. So one of the tools that the lifeguards really want to know is, because we have to, they have to wait till we go out and dive to bring the receivers up to download them, and sometimes that can take weeks for them to get the data about what sharks are hanging out off their beach. So to answer these questions, we now have a cell buoy that we can anchor out off the beach, and when a shark swims within 300 yards of one of these buoys, the buoy actually uses a cell repeater to store the data in the cloud. The lifeguards become uh, enrolled in a program where they'll get a text alert. So every time a shark's detected, they'll get a text alert in their phone that'll tell them what shark when that shark was tagged and how big that shark was. And then there'll be a website that they'll be able to go log into and see where that shark has been. So what's really cool is all that data gets stored in the cloud and then people can access that information. So lifeguards can use that to figure out in real time who's hanging out by their beach and when. In addition to trying to figure out why sharks are spending time at a beach, we need better tools. So one of the tools that we're developing are autonomous underwater tracking robots. So we got a grant from the National Science Foundation and I'm working with a roboticist at Harvey Mudd College. And what we do is this is an underwater robot, it's autonomous, so we can program it to go out. We put a pair of hydrophones on it and, and what the hydrophones are doing is listening for the tag and it's measuring the time of arrival from the transmitter on the, on the shark's back to reach the two hydrophones. And based on that, it can tell where the shark is in 3D space and time. Now we program the robot to not chase the shark. We want it to know where it is, but not follow the shark. Now these robots have propellers, so they make noise. And we know the sharks can hear them. So when the sharks detect the robot, sometimes they swim to the robot. And when the robot detects the shark moving towards it, the robot moves away. And then when the shark gets bored and turns around and starts going the other way, the robot turns and starts to follow it. So the cool thing about these robots is that they're programmed to move up and down through the water column. They're measuring water temperature, light, salinity. They have video cameras, so they're recording everything that's happening around the shark. And then we can pick up the robots, download that, and recreate the world around the shark and ask, why are they at this beach? Is it because this stretch of beach has more stingrays than the one further down, or the water's warmer here? So by using this technology, we can begin to answer those questions. The other tool we're using, and this one's really cool, it's, it's a Fitbit for sharks. So this is a little Fitbit backpack that we made for baby white sharks. It's got a 3D accelerometer that measures every motion the shark makes 30 times a second. It's got a 3D compass, so we've got a gyro on it. It's got a temperature sensor, a depth sensor, and it's got a transmitter, so we can follow it from a boat, or a robot can follow it. And then this black thing you see here is a video logger, so we can see what the shark sees. So this little device clamps on the shark's back, on the dorsal fin like a backpack, and here's the shark being released. This is Belmont Shore right off Long Beach. Those are junior lifeguards all lined up on the beach waiting to say, is it safe to go in the water? 
And then there's that shark swimming away. So we follow that shark from a boat for 24 hours. And after 24 hours, this is designed to pop off, float to the surface. We can pick it up and download it, just like you when you look at your daily Fitbit information. So last summer, we tracked three of these sharks, and we got amazing data. So one of the things that we noticed is that when we release the sharks, they swim faster. And they're I kind of relate it to like a little kid wearing a backpack the first day of class. You know, and the backpack's really full, and they're leaning back, and they're struggling with it. But by the time they're halfway through the school year, they're used to carrying the backpack. So what we see is that when they first start carrying it, they're swimming faster. And then by the time you get in the evening, they start slowing down. And by the next morning, they start speeding up again. So two of the sharks that we tracked off Belmont Shore, this is the um, Naples Peninsula right here, and here's Los Alamitos Harbor. You see that this shark is just basically cruising back and forth along the beach during the day. But at night, would actually go out and swim around the oil islands and by dawn the next day, we'll be back at the beach. So using this technology, this is based on what we got from tracking the shark, we also got some really interesting patterns. When we looked at some of the video, some of the video camera footage was tilted, and we couldn't figure out whether the shark had dislodged the camera. But it wasn't until we started looking at the accelerometer data that we began to recognize that the shark was swimming in a 30-foot diameter circle in a bank and they would swim a perfect circle like this. So two of the three sharks did this behavior for hours. And what they would do is swim in a circle for 20 minutes in one direction, and then all of a sudden turn around and go the opposite direction for 20 minutes. And then they'd turn around and go the opposite direction again. For and they did this for four hours. And you can see that the circles drifted over time. So we were trying to figure out what is, what is going on here? What are they doing? So when we started looking in the scientific literature, it turns out that migratory birds that constantly fly will actually turn off half their brain and fly in tight circles for a small period of time, then turn off the other half of their brain and turn around and go in the opposite direction. Now, white sharks are what we call obligate ram ventilators, which means they must continuously swim in order to breathe. So what we think this might represent is actually sleeping for a white shark. So they might be turning off half their brain and swimming in one direction, and then they turn off the other half of their brain and swim in the other direction. If we didn't have this technology, we would not have been able to see this. So the other tool that we're using and all the lifeguards are using are drones. So they become a very powerful tool. They're a great tool in filmmaking. They're also a very powerful tool in science. So all the lifeguards are using drones. When a shark's spotted, they'll send a drone out rather than send a lifeguard out to try to locate that shark. But the challenge is they have to be able to identify what that species is from that drone footage. And the lifeguards, you know, they're not marine biologists, so they do the best they can. So we've been working with computer scientists and engineers to help develop software for them that will help recognize what species of shark it is based on its body shape and how it swims. In addition, we can also estimate the size of the sharks because that becomes another important factor in helping them decide whether they should close a beach. And working with our computer scientist friends at Harvey Mudd, we can track individuals using hover data to try to determine who wants to be next to each other. In other words, when they're hanging out, are they doing that for social reasons or are they constantly mixing amongst each other? So these drone technologies can become very powerful tools in helping us understand not only why these sharks are using the beach, how they're using the beach, but help lifeguards decide how they should regulate the beach. And as was pointed out in the film, we use our underwater video cameras, we call them RUVs, and the sharks swim up and take selfies. And before I had undergrads going through and hand sketching these, now we're developing facial recognition software for white sharks, so they don't do it autonomously. So we'll be able to run the footage through, the software will measure multiple points between the face, the head, the gills, and the tail, and we'll start to build libraries, digital libraries of these sharks. Um, one of the other tools that we've been using are all the helicopter pilots in Southern California, many of whom have been flying for over 40 years and have told me they've never seen more sharks than they have in the last 10 years. So the police departments, fire departments, sheriff's departments, all are equipped with good video systems, and we've built a cell phone app for them, so while they're flying, they can take video or still footage of sharks, record how many individuals they see, how large the sharks are, uh, location, of course, all that's captured in the video, and they can record how many people are in the water around them, how many surfers, how many lifeguards, how many stand-up paddleboarders, and then when they get back from their flight, all this gets uploaded in the cloud. And then we can pull that information down, and we can begin to use that to start asking how many sharks are out there because they're flying over a coastline constantly. So in addition, one of the other tools that we want to start 
looking at are our risk assessment. And this becomes a really difficult thing because those pilots, even the news crews have offered to do this for us because they have great cameras on there. They're going to start flying transects along the beach. And then using artificial intelligence software, we're going to go through and count how many people are there on the beach at that time, what is their distance from shore, what are they doing, if there are sharks or wildlife near them, how close are the wildlife near them, are the wildlife moving towards them, or are the wildlife moving away from them. So by using this technology, we can begin to answer, well, is it really that dangerous that surfers are out amongst these sharks? Because we don't have that information. So one of the other cool things that we got to try last summer is, believe it or not, all living organisms slough off cells, and within those cells are their DNA. Once the DNA leaves an animal's body, it's considered environmental DNA. But we can go out and take water samples, which is something that we did at, at Padero. And from a water sample, we can screen that down, and then we can probe that water for white shark DNA. So what we found was we had tagged a bunch of sharks here. We had receivers here. We were detecting the sharks consistently moving back and forth along this stretch of Padero. And then we had these two sites, which are located up current. And we took water samples here and here, here and here. The only places we got positive hits for white shark eDNA was at Padero, none here. So what this means is that we might be able to just go out and take water samples at a location. Even when the water clarity is really poor, we can't see them from the surface. We could detect whether a white shark has been present just based on the, its leftover DNA in the water. So using some calibration, we're going to start to try to calibrate how long that DNA lasts, how far it extends from where those sharks may be. And you could actually even take the amount of DNA you get from the water to estimate how much mass of white shark is in the water present. So the cool thing about this is now we have these autonomous surface vehicles that you can launch from the beach. And they have water samplers on them. And we can tell them to go along the beach at Pacific particular locations, take up a water sample, run that across a filter, put it across a gene tip, and in real time, into the cloud, the data will send alerts saying we've detected white shark eDNA at this location. All this technology exists. So one of the things we're really working on right now is many of our partners need more information. They need education. So we're working very closely with lifeguards to provide them with an education program to help them identify wildlife along the beaches. Many of the lifeguards are summer. They only work during the summer. Um, many of them are not marine biologists. So we're teaching them how to tell a dolphin dorsal fin from a white shark dorsal <laughs> fin. And particularly with the drone footage, how to tell many of the marine life apart just from the drone footage. In addition, we're working to help help them identify what constitutes aggressive behavior. Because when a shark sighted along a beach and they close a beach, those have economic impacts to those communities. So being able to assess whether the shark's behavior appears to be aggressive or not might dictate whether or not they have to close a beach or not. So in addition, there's some classic white shark footage. The other challenge that we face is these sharks come back. Fishers are ac accidentally interacting with them more or intentionally interacting them with, with them more. So in recent years, we've had big problems with people deliberately going out and catching white sharks. And it's illegal to do this, but quite often you'll see it on social media. So we're developing education programs for fishers. Quite often they'll say, well, I thought it was a mako shark. Uh, in addition, they're fishing off piers when they do this. They're using very large gear. They're chumming, um, which is another problem. So it is not illegal to chum in California waters. It's stupid to chum off a pier where there are people swimming, but it's not illegal. So right now, there's a lot of policy changes that need to be made. And of course, the more the public knows about these things, the safer everybody can be. Um, the other really interesting thing is we have a shark job program. So US Fish and Wildlife Service contacted me a couple months ago and said, we just got a bunch of shipment of shark jaws from Southeast Asia for the curio market, and they're all labeled as bull shark. And I said, okay. So they brought them to us, and we started looking through, and, and maybe three out of the 50 jaws that they showed us were bull sharks. And they said, well, you know, and in addition, there were a lot of protected species in those shipments. So they basically confiscated all of them, 4,800 of them. So they were going to destroy them, and I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to have an education program. So anybody out there that's part of an educational institution, we can give you sets of shark jaws you can use for education and all the educational information that goes with it. So we provide you all the information about what species it is and information about the sharks. So I have 4,800 pairs of shark jaws to get out of my lab. So if you're interested, please contact me. 
Um, in addition, we're going to be producing PSAs. We've already started to do this. Um, we're going to do them for sharks, we're going to do them for stingrays, we're going to do them for, for riptides of pollution. And we've been working with many of the TV networks about using this as PSAs during the weather forecasts because they have some dead time. And this is a great time for us to put in a quick 10 second spot on how, when is stingray season and how to avoid stepping on stingrays. So what do you do if you encounter a shark? Um, in addition, we're working with many of the public aquaria. And of course, we'll have website information about much of the science that we're finding. So instead of me having to come talk to you all the time, you'll be able to go online and see all the cool tracks that we're getting. So we have a lot of partners in this research. It's a big project. So we have many of the cities that are working with us. We have funding now from the state of California to expand this research and education program. And we pretty much work with all the lifeguards from San Diego, Santa Barbara. So with that, thank you. And I thank Harry for being here. So we're going to do a little Q&A, and then uh, I think Harry has a little three-minute kind of blooper reel to show you if you want to see. stay for that, too. So uh, I think Will's going to get the lights up for us. And yes, Mr. Wilson, Carrie, yes. I had a question in regards to the, the sharks are predominantly near the shore, and I understand the round ray and the bat ray and the elephant seals being what they're feeding on. When they become pelagic, which is, I think, really unique, they become a different So the question is, with all the um, bat rays, elephant seals, what are they feeding on out there? In the pelagic state. In the pelagic state. It, it's Santa Barbara, you know, Mexican food, but actually, <laughs> Chris could do it. <laughs> so, so the, when they make that oceanic shift, it is unclear exactly what they're eating out there. What's hypothesized? When they're out in the middle of the Pacific, it's thought that squid is probably the main thing that they're eating. And the, the way they figure that out, yeah, so they're diving down. There's actually a lot of squid in that part of the ocean. And the other thing is, my personal hypothesis, because my relatives were whalers and they did a lot of whaling out there, there are a lot of sperm whales out there. So, so it's possible that they're also occasionally getting some marine mammal meals, but based on what we see from, from their muscle isotopes when they first come back to the islands, it doesn't match marine mammals. So the thought is they're either eating fish or squid when they're in that oceanic phase. Mr. McCorkle. Uh, I have a question that I've never figured out. Does the female white shark come into the nursery area and have the babies in the nursery area, or does it have the babies out in the ocean and they come to the nursery area? So the, the question is, do the female sharks have their babies in the nursery area, or they do that further out at sea and then come in with the babies into the nursery area? So that's probably the holy grail that every, every shark biologist wants to figure out. Where do they mate and where do they give birth? So, and we don't know the answer to either. Um, based on the patterns of distribution patterns that we see. So the thing you have to remember, white sharks are warm bodied. So if you touch the white, uh, an adult white shark on, the, on her skin, she'd feel cool. But if you stuck a thermometer to her body, you'd watch the mercury rise. So those babies are incubating inside a warm mom. What I think is happening is I think they're pupping in deep water. And then when those babies come out of a warm mom into cool water, they're like, brr. <laughs> and that drives them up to the surface. Now, remember those four hotspot areas I talked about? You know, Santa Barbara, kind of uh, Ventura, you've got Santa Monica Bay, you've got Huntington Beach, you know, that area, and then Dana Point. All of those locations have deep water canyons that come all the way to the shoreline. So it's possible that females, that we, we don't see big females along our beaches, are pupping in deep water. That's why we don't see them. And then the pups move up those deep water canyons to the shoreline, and that's how they find the beaches. That's the best I got for you. Hopefully a couple years we'll be able to answer that. Yes. Question. So the question is, a lot of the local attacks are on, uh, attacking the plastic of the kayaks. Why is that happening? 
Yeah, I'm not sure anybody really knows the answer to that question. Um, one of the hypotheses that people have posed is, it, you know, maybe it looks like a competitor and the sharks are viewing it as a threat and going up and taking a bite. I mean, most of the people that are on the kayaks don't get hurt, um, which, you know, could be the shark bites into it and goes, well, this isn't what I thought it was and just takes off and leaves it. Um, so we, the answer is we don't really know in most cases why sharks bite people. So whether it be a kayak or a surfer or a swimmer, we just honestly don't know. We think that in some cases they're accidents, some cases they may be mistaken identity, in some cases it could be defense, but uh, right now the, I, we just have no idea why they bite kayaks. Yes? Um, you talked a lot about technology in your presentation. What's your future dream technology? What's the future dream technology? Oh my God, you want more? <laughs> I was thinking I was doing good. No, it's amazing. It is amazing. So, so the cool thing now is the internet of everything, right? So we have this cloud up there and we can have all this autonomous technology out there that's gathering this information, not just about sharks, not just about what the sharks are doing, but about the ocean itself. And the ability to pull all that information together and have that gathered so that biologists and scientists can pull all that information together is, is amazing. And it's changing the way we study the ocean. So um, every day I'm learning about a new tool, a new technology, a new software program. And artificial intelligence is gonna make everything that we do that's been very painstaking much faster. So right now, you know, I try to recruit great marine biology students, but I'm also looking for engineers and computer scientists because that's, that's the future of the field. Maybe one more question, or are we good? One, yes. Um, I noticed uh, on your PSA that you had the uh, written uh, look at into the eye of the shark and make sure that the shark is looking at you. Do you is that advice if you have an encounter, and do you have any other advice for us? So, so the question is, what advice do you have when you run into a shark? First one, don't find one to begin with, but go ahead. So, oh, yeah. so before he answers that, this is Kelly and Michelle, and they both had a very unique close-up experience with a rather large adult gray white while you were, and I think you were just learning to stand a paddle, right, Michelle? So that's, that's what brings this question to you. Sir, sir. How should they have behaved? Great, great. So the, the, again, the bottom line is we don't know. The one thing we do know about predators, and it's not just sharks, it's pretty much any predator, um, the whole thing is about sneaking up. Right, so if, you know, if the predator knows you see it, half the gig is up, right? And regardless of the size phenomenon, you're bigger than me or I'm smaller than you, the idea that you're watching it and you're tracking it means that the gig is up. And they don't want to get hurt. They don't know how dangerous you are. Now the thing is, when you're on a board, you know, obviously there are no eyes on the board, but you do have a nose on the board, right? There's a pointy part, and if you point the board towards the animal and you track it, the animal feels like it's being watched. So there's not a lot of good data on this, but many of the people that are in the water, I've always told us, like the guy swimming backwards, right? So he's looking for the shark. So, and that's why we say, you know, when we're out and we're looking for sharks, you see a shark, quite often you'll see it and it'll cruise by. It doesn't mean it's being aggressive or anything. And then you'll lose it in the murk, right? The first place you should look is behind you because that's what they're gonna do. They're gonna come behind you. They know where your eyes are. So if you can always track the shark with your eyes, Quite often the gig is up and they'll go, okay, whatever, and take off. Maybe one more, one last question. They bought shark bands to keep the sharks away? So you want to know, does that really work? Okay. You want to take that one in? No. <laughs> so, so shark repellents are, have become very popular, and there are a variety of types. There have been chemical repellents, electrical repellents, magnetic repellents. Um, we tested many of them in the shark lab for 40 years. I have never found one that works to my satisfaction. Um, with that, um, if you feel more comfortable buying them and you're, you're okay with them working 40% or 50% of the time, um, it's up to you. 
Um, the bottom line is your chances of being bitten by a shark are already so low. And just being aware that they're out there and, and paying attention when you're out in the water, I think that and that probably is as good a shark deterrent as you're going to find. Okay, so, so actually if you want sharks to find you, you can take it from me. I've been nicknamed Shark Magnet because in May alone, in one week, I fell on a great white. And then I got stepped on a leopard shark and got bit in my ankle. So if you want to see them, just follow me. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Safe home. Remember to grab some information on your way out.